Welcome to Camera 101. It's my desire to give you a basic overview of the components that make up your camera system. While the specifics may change from camera to camera, the general components will not. They will be the same regardless of which camera system you choose to use. If you have a question regarding the gear that I'm using to make this production, or others that I've worked on, feel free to check out my website as well as my blog as I have a detailed listing of all the gear that I use along with links from where they can be purchased. And with that, let's get started. The camera body is the one part of the camera system that will constantly change over the years. Size, features, and layout will change depending on the type of camera and the manufacturer. This is the heart of your camera package, and it will determine the maximum capturing quality of your final images. You cannot produce images of higher quality than what the camera will record. From this point forward, everything else will degrade. This is why cinematographers and DPs want to and push for the highest capture quality device that a budget will allow for. As a DP, it is your job to know and learn the various camera systems, their strengths, and their weaknesses. There are too many cameras, and they are updated too quickly to go into much detail here. But the web is a great place to do your research before putting your hands on an actual camera. Lenses are a very close second, and maybe even tie for first in importance in a camera system. The quality of the glass that you put on the camera body will go a long way in helping you to produce quality imagery. If the lenses are of poor quality, then the final images will suffer. Poor quality glass on a high-end camera system will degrade the final images, whereas high quality glass on a low-end camera system will help you to get the most out of that system. Of course, every rule is meant to be broken. But the key in breaking rules is first to have a deep understanding of the rule before you break it. There are many older lenses that by today's standards are technically flawed. However, it is because of these imperfections that they can lend a unique look to the final image. For example, some of my favorite lenses are the Cook S2 and S3 lenses. I really like the softness and warm creamy skin tones that they add to the final image, even though they are not as technically perfect as modern lenses are today. So I encourage you to get out and play with different lenses from different manufacturers. Each lens model will have its own unique characteristics that may be helpful in adding to the images for a particular production you might be working on. Characteristics that you'll want to keep an eye on are Bokeh, how the out of focus areas are rendered, speed, how fast is the lens, and how does it look when it's wide open? Is it too soft for your taste? Is there a sweet spot in the lens where the lens is sharp but still has a nice shallow depth of field? Does the image start to suffer when the lens is stopped down too far? Fall off. Is the lens uniform in exposure? Do you see vignetting around the edges? Is the focus sharp from edge to edge? Flaring. What happens when the lens is flared? Is the lens flare pleasing to you? Color. How does the lens reproduce color? Is it warm? Is it cool? What does it add or take away from the image? As with the camera body itself, there isn't one right choice of one set of lenses all the time for every project. Some choices are more appropriate than others, and it will just take time, experimentation, and viewing footage shot with various lenses to learn what might be best in a given situation. And now would be a good time to quickly address the differences between a cinema lens and an SLR lens. Even though the glass in modern SLR lenses and in modern cinema lenses may be very similar, there are two big differences. First of all, the mechanics. SLR lenses were not designed to meet the needs of continually pulling focus. Their focus scales are small, and the barrel rotation is short. This makes pulling focus a lot more difficult than on a cinema lens that has large focus scales and usually close to a full 360 degrees of barrel rotation. One of the deficiencies of the mechanics of SLR glass is that prime lenses are much more prone to breathe than their cinema counterparts. This is not to say that cinema lenses do not breathe, just that there is greater emphasis put in the design process in making sure they do not breathe. Lens breathing can be a visual distraction to the viewer, and it can cause compositional changes to the image that are not wanted. Many times, SLR lenses will be made with plastic to reduce their cost. There's nothing particularly wrong with this for stills use, but they can quickly get beaten up and worn out in the day in and day out use in the cinema world. Because SLR lenses are meant for still photography, their mechanics were never meant to be used in a cinema setting. And these deficiencies are not that big of a deal and rarely get noticed in the stills world. Secondly, finding a matched set. Although lens manufacturers like Zeiss are starting to come out with matched sets of SLR lenses, more often than not, SLR lenses will not be matched at all. What I mean by matched set is that the complete set of lenses has a matching maximum aperture, they render color the same way, 
and they have the same bokeh. Part of good cinematography is maintaining a consistent look throughout a scene, and it can be difficult to do that when using an unmatched set of lenses. Generally speaking, a best practice of good cinematography is to light and expose at one aperture for a given scene. Let's say you have the following set of lenses, an 18mm T3.5, 25mm T2.8, 35mm T2, 50mm T1.4, and an 85mm T1.4. Using this set of lenses means that you have to light and expose your scene at the lowest common denominator lens if you plan on using that lens. From the set I just mentioned, that means that you have to light everything to at least a T3.5, or more realistically, a T4, so that you can use that 18mm lens. That means you need almost eight times more light than you would need for lighting at a T1.4 exposure. Alternatively, you could not use that lens if the lighting would not accommodate it. But if a director wants that 18 millimeter shot, you're going to have to light for it. And that T4 might just kill you. Then there's the issue of color matching between lenses. While a lot can be done in post to balance color of the final image, it adds extra work that could have been avoided in the first place by using a matched set of lenses. Remember, our job as competent and talented cinematographers is to aid in the visual storytelling process, not be a distraction to it. I could go on and on about the importance of the lens choice in creating the final image, but I think that's enough to get you headed in the right direction. The follow focus is key to making it easy to keep your images in focus. The main purpose of the follow focus is to take your hand off of the lens and to move it to a more ergonomic position to pull focus. By moving your hand off of the lens and to the side of the camera, you will reduce any vibrations that may be transmitted to the final image that might occur if you are pulling directly from the lens. That is not to say that you cannot pull straight off the lens, just that it's not preferred. Additionally, the follow focus allows for a more comfortable position from which to operate the focus of the lens, and in some setups, it's physically impossible to reach the lens to pull focus. But the most important reason to use a follow focus, in my opinion, is to be able to quickly, easily, and repeatedly hit marks. The focus disc on the follow focus is meant to be marked up and used to make focus marks to aid in pulling focus, something that's not easily done if you're pulling focus from the lens. If you do end up having to pull focus directly from the lens, here are a couple of tips to help you be more effective. First of all, use a china marker on the lens. If the lens is big enough, you can use a white china marker to mark focus points directly on the lens itself. Or secondly, use spike tape to create your own scales or marks. Wrap the tape all the way around the lens and then use a pen to mark your focus points. Oftentimes a matte box is just seen as camera flare, that accessory you need to have to make your camera look professional, especially if you're shooting on a small DSLR. But I would argue that a matte box is a critical part of the camera system that should not go overlooked. Good cinematography is all about controlling light light that falls on the set, as well as light that enters your lens. And it is the matte box that will help you control the light that enters your lens. One of the most important aspects of the matte box is that it blocks unintended light from striking the lens. When unintended light hits the lens, it will wash out the final image, lowering its contrast. This will be all the more problematic if lower quality lenses are being used, as they are more prone to flaring. The eyebrow and side flags of the matte box help to further flag off any unintentional light and make sure that the final image is as clean as possible. The second important aspect of the matte box is that it allows for quick and easy use of filtration. Whether using ND filters to control exposure or an effects filter to help create a look, being able to hold and quickly change filters allows the cinematographer to really control the look of the image and keep on schedule on set. Before moving on, I want to address the use of screw-in filters and lens hoods. After looking at the cost of filters and matte boxes, you may be wondering why you shouldn't just use screw-in filters and lens hoods. After all, they're a lot cheaper. Well, the answer is that you can use them. There are times when you can get away with that option, and no one will ever know the difference. But here is why I would recommend against it. Firstly, speed. A matte box allows for much quicker and easier swapping of filtration on set. This becomes most noticeable when shooting outside and the lighting conditions change frequently. It might only take one to two extra minutes to change that screw-in filter, but do that 10 times and you've just spent an extra 10 to 20 minutes changing filtration when you could have been shooting or moving on to the next setup. Secondly, screw-in filters and lens hoods do not offer the same amount of control as a matte box does. The filter trays allow you to slide a filter up and down or rotate it into the correct position, something that is just not possible with screw-in filters. 
and the lens hood only works from one angle around the lens, whereas the eyebrow and side flags can be infinitely positioned to remove any light that may strike the lens. There are at least two parts of a good tripod system, the legs and the head. The quality of this system will affect the quality of the camera movement on screen. Unless you plan on never moving the camera, a quality tripod head is a must. A quality head is one that is based around a true fluid system. This system allows the operator to smoothly move the camera, tilting and panning it such that it starts smoothly and comes to a smooth stop. A tripod head of poor quality will not allow for smooth movement, especially when starting, stopping, or changing directions, which leads to jerkiness in the camera operating, as well as compositional issues when starting or stopping. The legs of the tripod are also key to a good system. The more robust the legs are, the more support they will give, and the more precarious positions the camera can be placed in. There have been times when I have needed to place 50 pounds of sandbags on the tripod legs to hang a camera over the ledge, and I could not have done it if I was using a cheap tripod. One quick note about the weight rating of tripod heads. The rating of the head is based on the center of gravity of the camera being immediately or close to the top of the tripod head. The further out the center of gravity is, the more force that the tripod head experiences. So even though your camera system may only weigh 10 pounds and your head may be able to carry 12 pounds, if the center of gravity is too high, your camera may be experiencing a load of 15 or more pounds, needlessly wearing out the head and making it more difficult to operate. This is usually a problem when adding additional heavy accessories to the top of the camera. Instead, the accessories should be lowered through the use of additional rods and mounting plates. In this age of digital acquisition, having a good on-camera monitor is a must. Most digital cameras do not have an optical viewfinder, so having a monitor that is large enough and has enough resolution to verify focus is imperative. For HD work, I recommend getting a monitor that has a resolution of at least 1280 by 720. Without it, you will never be able to quite know for sure if the image is sharp or not. Additionally, if the monitor can be calibrated, that will be very helpful when viewing it on set. The more controls you have on the monitor, the more confident you can feel when watching the footage on set. However, no matter how good that monitor is, it should still be treated as if it was just a video tap from a film camera. It will give you a good representation of what you are capturing, but it does not necessarily reflect the final image. On set, unless you are in a controlled environment like a blackened tent, there are too many varying factors that will influence your perception of the image on that monitor. So get to know your camera system well enough to know when what you are recording and what you are seeing on the monitor do not match up. Having a quality monitor and having it calibrated correctly will also go a long way in helping those who are less technically inclined feel better about the images they are seeing. The last thing you want to have happen is to have to adjust something on set because of how it comes across on the monitor, only to find out in post that everything was fine to begin with and the adjustment just ruined the shot. And that segues nicely into the last part of the camera system. The light meter is the most integral part of the camera system, in my opinion. As cinematographers, our role is to shape the telling of the story through careful placement of light and camera movement. And the light meter is the tool that will help you produce professional, repeatable results. I'm not going to go into detail here about how or why to use a meter. That's covered in Lighting 101. But the short answer is, the light meter allows you to scout a location, communicate intelligently with your crew, and feel confident about your exposure, despite what the monitor might be displaying. The light meter will help you not only control exposure, but control your lighting ratios, and to help you do exposure compensation calculations without having to remember all the maths. Additionally, as you use your meter, you will begin to see light in a whole new way, and you will be able to begin to recognize various light levels. And after gaining enough experience and familiarity with light and your capture device, you'll be able to light without using a meter. But that skill does not come without training your eye, and the light meter is the perfect tool for that job. So there you have it, a basic introduction and overview of the camera system. You can support this content and the creation of future videos by purchasing my camera and lighting tutorials at thecinematographerseries.com or by buying my stock footage at ryanewalters.com. Until next time, get out there and shoot.